I'm really excited and thrilled to be here and to talk about this topic that I'm very passionate about and that is supporting young adults with high functioning autism spectrum disorder in post-secondary educational settings. I want to give you a little bit of context with respect to why I decided to study this as part of my PhD program. In 2008, I did my master's internship with the Provincial Outreach Program for Autism and Related Disorders, um, POPARD. And through that internship, I traveled around British Columbia providing consultations and psychoeducational assessments for children and teens with autism. And it was during that year, which was seven years ago, that I often pondered and reflected to myself, what is going to happen to the teens that are going to transition to po transition out of high school? Where are they going to go? Where are they going to live? Are they good candidates for post-secondary education? What supports are available for them? And there was a big question mark there, and I often pondered with my graduate supervisor who's at the back of the room, Dr. Bill McKee, about this. And that was when I went ding, 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 this is going to be an area that I'm going to study as part of my, my doctoral dissertation. So just a bit of background information with respect to why I'm here and how I got here. So for the next hour or so, I'm going to do a brief review of the literature regarding factors related to post-secondary functioning for students with autism spectrum disorder. And I just want to say, when I go over some of this background information, I'm not intending for it to be negative in any way. But what it does do is paints a very realistic picture of what is documented in the literature and where we can go from here. I will be presenting the results of my research study, which looked at the lived experiences of students with high-functioning autism spectrum disorder in college or university, talk about future directions, and then leave some time for questions. I have um, a bit of a disclaimer at the bottom. I used pseudonames throughout this presentation to protect the anonymity and confidentiality of my research participants. So as we all know, autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disability characterized by clinically significant impairments in social interaction and communication and restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior. ASD is often diagnosed in childhood and research has shown that the deficits do persist into adulthood. Recent estimates according uh, to the Center for Di Disease Control and Prevention have indicated an increase in diagnosis with one in 68 children being identified with autism spectrum disorder. As of last week, there was another study that was published indicating that the prevalence is now one in 45. However, that report is not an official report from the CDC. Within this, more children are being identified with autism spectrum disorder without significant cognitive impairment. So these are children with IQs over 70, um, with 100 being average. And that's also known as high functioning autism spectrum disorder. It has been argued that we're likely to see more students with HFA enroll in post-secondary education as they often have the neurocognitive ability and academic ability to do well in a college or university setting. Some studies have shown that students and their parents have aspirations of attending college or university. However, there's other studies documenting poor post-secondary educational outcomes for this group. A study in 2009, published in 2009 um, by Camarena and Sergiani, investigated the post-secondary aspirations of 21 adolescents with HFA and their parents. They ranged in ages from 12 to 18, and it included 12 males and one female in their sample. Um, of, from the results, all viewed attending college as an important aspiration. All were confident that they would actually attend a two-year or a four-year program. And 57% per, of the adolescents expressed pursuing a four-year degree. Despite having the ability and the aspirations of attending post-secondary education, studies have shown poor post-secondary educational outcomes for this group. Shattuck and colleagues published a study in the Pediatrics Journal in 2012, um, which was part of a very large U.S. Department of Education National Longitudinal Transition Study where they followed participants for 10 years. It was, it was a 10-year prospective longitudinal study. Um, of their sample of 680 youth with autism spectrum disorder, 34.7% of the youth attended um, post-secondary education, and they found that it was the lowest participation rate compared to students with specific learning disorder, speech and language impairment, um, and a few other disabilities that I'll talk about in a moment. And they basically concluded that youth with USD are at high risk for no enrollment. Wei and colleagues um, using 
data from the, that larger study um, found through their study that students are less likely to enroll. Students with ASD are less likely to enroll compared to students with specific learning disorder, speech and language impairment, hearing or vision impairments, orthopedic impairments, other health impairments, which is typically known as ADHD um, in the United States, and traumatic brain injury. In other papers, many have purported that if those individuals make that transition to post-secondary education, that they're at higher risk for dropout soon after entry. Now you might be wondering, why is this the case? Why are the post-secondary educational outcomes poor for right now for, for individuals with ASD? Well, there's cardinal features of the syndrome that are likely to impede functioning in post-secondary um, education based on their behavioral phenotype or their characteristics. One is um, their social interaction and communication skills. So as we know, these individuals can have difficulties in engaging in back and forth conversations, understanding nonverbal cues, reading social cues, sarcasm, jokes, engaging in that social chit chat, as well as finding common, common or shared interests with other people on, on college campuses. And these skills are all part of developing meaningful relationships in a college or university setting. Romantic relationships often develop in post-secondary education, if not before then. Um, and given the social challenges and the communication challenges, this is an area that's, that's a bit difficult for, for our group with HFA. Um, research has shown that sometimes they use excessive um, social overtures showing obsessional interest, um, which may come across as, as um, you know, not socially appropriate in, in many respects. Another cardinal feature of HFA is restricted and repetitive behaviors, as you know. Um, it's, been ported that, it's been purported that the RRBs um, can interfere with socialization and adapting to a post-secondary environment. For example, an individual may talk at length about their interest, may be perceived, and therefore may be perceived as odd or eccentric, or maybe even rude if they're talking about what they want to talk about for a length of time and not really soliciting what the other person or what the other listener has to offer, or maybe um, in inviting them to speak about something that they may want to speak about. Unexpected changes in class schedule, pop quizzes, canceled classes, lack of seat assignment in lecture halls are all things about a post-secondary education that could present challenges for our students who um, are well accustomed to routines and to a specific transition that typically works well for them. In the most recent manual, the DSM manual, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, fifth edition, included the, the sensory dysregulation criteria. So individuals with autism often have hypersensitivities or, or hyposensitivities to lights and textures and noise, etc. cetera. Um, and so in a post-secondary environment, issues such as filtering out noises in the classroom like social chatter, noise from the light. So we don't recognize that these fluorescent lights in the room make noise, but they actually have a very subtle humming noise and some of our students can pick up on that noise and it can be quite distracting for them. The smells of other students, um, the smells of the classroom, being in large auditoriums, the student union building. There's lots of noise and traffic in the student union building as well as lots of different smells, um, which can be hard for our students to, to process. And then lastly, campus residences. So living with roommates and, and aspects of cooking and general hygiene, I mean, pardon me, uh, cooking, the smells in the cafeteria, as well as the furniture that's provided in campus residence might be actually uncomfortable in some respects for, for some students. Adaptive behavior functioning is um, a fancy word for independent daily living skills such as cleaning, cooking, and general hygiene. Um, how this might affect a student with autism in post-secondary education is um, things like following a cafeteria meal plan, shopping, general grooming and hygiene, setting an alarm clock and making it on time to classes and to examinations, public transit and navigating the physical aspects of campus. Um, too often, um, what we see is that the adaptive behavior functioning of students with HFA is not commensurate, is not equal with their cognitive ability. So for example, I've got a few um, clients who are in the above average to gifted range academically and cognitively, but don't know how to make a sandwich or live alone and forget to eat and forget to eat to a point where they're admitted to the hospital to be fed through a tube. That's an extreme example, but it's a nice depiction of how there is a mismatch between cognitive functioning in an adaptive behavior living. Um, there's a few reasons why that might be, but one is in elementary and in secondary school, 
us as adults provide a lot of structure and support for these for these children and teens on the spectrum, and we do a, we put in a lot of um, effort and support systems and essentially in some respects do do those things for them but unfortunately when they're transitioning to post-secondary education they don't have those skills in place to to be as independent as possible with respect to academic functioning um, our students with autism often do well academically in high school, which makes them good candidates for post-secondary education. Um, in fact, research studies have shown that students with autism have higher enrollment in STEM programs in college and universities. So STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. So higher rates of enrollment in those programs compared to individuals with um, individuals in the general population, and also compared to individuals in other disability groups. Um, so that's a great thing because it's been argued that they can be valuable contributors in the workforce in those areas. That being said, they're still less likely to enroll compared to those other groups, but do have this, um, this niche, so to speak. The demands are higher in post-secondary education, and again, they're not as structured by teachers and parents. They're ever-changing with multiple classrooms and multiple buildings that you need to go to and navigating different aspects of the college campus, making it difficult. Fortunately, students with disabilities um, can be eligible for educational accommodations, such as extra time on examinations, a separate setting for examinations. And essentially, the purpose of educational accommodations is to level the playing field between individuals with disabilities and individuals without disabilities. Now, in order to be eligible for accommodations, students need to provide disability documentation, so it's typically a psychoeducational assessment, that outlines their disability and the functional impact of that disability. So how is it impacting their academic performance in, in, in education? Self-advocacy skills. Um, Oh, I, I think I skipped over executive functioning there, I did. <laughs> so executive functioning, um, as you can see right at the top there, is um, a multi-dimensional concept involving our ability to plan, to organize, to initiate tasks, to complete tasks, to monitor our own behavior, to self-regulate, so on and so forth. It's been purported that executive functioning um, is a core deficit in autism spectrum disorder. Um, in college and university, I can see that there's probably a handful of, of post-secondary students in the room. We use executive functioning in college and university all the time. We use it to um, plan for assignments, papers that are due on the same day, planning ahead to get those papers done, planning ahead for examinations, splitting our time for examinations that are on the same day, splitting the, the study time. Um, so our students made me prompts to study, um, prompts to initiate term projects, and papers ahead of time. Self-advocacy skills are difficult um, for individuals with disabilities in general, and particularly with autism spectrum disorder. In um, post-secondary education, it's um, the responsibility of the student to disclose their disability to the Disability Services Office on campus in order to be considered for educational accommodations. It's not the responsibility of the institutions to actively identify these students. So that's a big difference between secondary school and post-secondary education. And this may come as a surprise to students um, and parents who, students with ASD and their parents who um, are accustomed to receiving services and then get to college or university and are told, oh no, we need this document, we need this document, so on and so forth. And lastly, psychiatric comorbidity. Um, anxiety and depressive disorders occur at a higher rate in this group compared to uh, the general population and compared to uh, individuals with ASD with lower IQs. Research has shown that this group is more likely to be, be prescribed one or more psychotropic medications. And some argue that there's different factors on a post-secondary educational, in a post-secondary educational environment that may lead to the onset or exacerbation of symptoms, including changes in the environment, coping with academic and social demands, and living independently, as well as environmental stressors. So some of the sensory dysregulation factors that I talked about. So 
again, I don't mean for these factors to come across as negative, but I think it's important that we do have a realistic perspective on the challenges that the, these students bring to post-secondary educational settings so we can be as preventative as possible and implement strategies to help them um, cope so they can demonstrate their ability academically as best as possible. Although research and professional work in the area of adults with ASD is gaining further attention, to date this remains a population that has not been well studied, particularly with respect to their experiences in post-secondary education. Understanding the experiences of students with HFA is a necessity and may provide valuable insight into their functioning in college university, including successes and challenges. To that end, my study addressed the following research question. What is the meaning of the lived experiences for students with HFA or Asperger's disorder attending college or university? So to answer this question, um, I'm not going to go too in depth about the research methodology, but I know there are a few researchers in the room and a few folks that may find this interesting. So I'm certainly going to touch on some aspects of, of how we, we obtained the results. So I used a qualitative methodology called Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis, IPA. And this methodology examines the meaning of personal and social experiences of individuals to better understand a phenomenon in a detailed, comprehensive, and flexible way. Participants are viewed as experts in their experiences and their perspectives are highly valued and respected. This was so important to me in this study. Really, the central tenet of the study was to give these individuals a voice for them to tell us what is it like for you in post-secondary education. Too often the voices of students with disabilities are unsolicited, overlooked, or minimized. And so again, this is the, the meat of this study was really soliciting what, it, what is it like for them and, and to what extent are different factors meaningful to them. In this method, the researcher plays an active role in, in interpretation in interpreting the meaning of the participants' lived experiences. 12 students with a formal diagnosis with, of either HFA or Asperger's disorder were recruited for this study. I had nine males and three females. All participants were enrolled either in college or university. They comprised undergraduate students from years one to three, and I included one graduate student as well. The age, is, um, pardon me, the age range was from 18 to 28. In terms of recruitment, I recruited from various post-secondary disability offices in British Columbia. Thank you to those of you in the audience that helped with that. Community agencies such as private practices, Autism Community Training BC, and SFU's Autism and Developmental Disorders Lab helped with recruitment with respect to putting my advertisement on their social media site. So a big thank you to all of them. Of the participants that expressed their interest in participating, I engaged in a telephone screening interview. This was a really important part of the study because this is where I determined whether or not the participant, the prospective participant, would be able to engage in an in-depth, detailed interview for at least an hour. Um, and that was quite important in order to get some rich data about their experiences. Um, I also took that opportunity to go over a few other um, inclusion criteria with them, including um, if they were currently enrolled in college or university, if they self-identify with having autism spectrum disorder. That was a really important factor. Their willingness to participate in a 60 to 90 minute interview with a person that they did not know, um, and a follow-up interview of 30 minutes regarding their experiences of attending college or university. And of course, with any study, we obtain background information such as their age, diagnosis, age of diagnosis, any comorbid diagnoses, so did they have any other diagnoses, current medications and supports received. For data collection, I engaged in um, individual, in-depth, semi-structured interviews, which allowed for a flexible yet in-depth discourse regarding their experiences. The mean length, the average length of each interview was about 75 minutes. And then I also engaged in a follow-up interview, which ranged from 30 to 45 minutes. And this is where the participants were given the opportunity to ask questions, clarify any of their thoughts, um, or share additional thoughts regarding their experiences. I also engaged in a member checking process here, which I'll describe in a few moments. Briefly, in terms of data analysis, transcripts were analyzed case by case, starting with the first interview. The process is systematic, it's iterative and interpretive, looking for particular and shared experiences across participants. 
I took an active role in interpreting what the participants conveyed in their interviews. Each analyzed transcript informed the analysis of the subsequent transcripts. Again, briefly, in terms of the analysis of transcripts, I engaged in a macro analysis for each one, which was more of a global analysis of each transcript, a micro analysis where I coded individual meaning units. All the data was visually represented through graphic organizers and a charting system. And then from here, emerged the broad themes and the sub-themes. When engaging in qualitative research, it's quite critical that researchers ensure the scientific rigor and credibility of their research findings. Um, Creswell recommends that at least two, um, sort of two procedures are implemented. Because it was my dissertation, I and for good quality research, I implemented five five validation strategies. Um, one was researcher reflexivity. So this is where I recognized and self-disclosed a priori, so prior to, any biases, assumptions, or beliefs that may affect the process of inquiry, may affect the questions that I ask, um, so on and so forth. And I did this by writing in um, a personal reflection section in my dissertation, and as well keeping a researcher's journal that I wrote in almost daily over the course of the research study. I had a peer reviewer, she's a psychologist, a PhD grad from UBC here. Um, she was not directly related to the study in any way, but had familiarity with the study and the topic. I had nine peer review sessions with her, um, and she challenged me to think critically throughout the study with respect to the research procedures and asked some difficult questions. Member checking is very important. This is where I elicited feedback from the participants themselves regarding the accuracy and the credibility of my interpretation of the interview transcripts. It's considered a critical and crucial strategy in qualitative research. I met with each participant in person, debriefed them on my data analysis process, and provided them with a one-page summary of their transcript to review and provide me feedback on my interpretation and give an indication of whether or not I, um, I got it right, so to speak. Thick and rich description is really for the readers. It's where I wrote the findings in a deep and detailed way so that when you go home tonight and you Google my dissertation, you're going to feel a sense of closeness to the participants and, and hopefully make claims about the transferability of the findings to your own practices, to your own settings. And lastly, I had an external auditor who was not related to the study in any way. She was also a psychologist, is also a psychologist, a PhD grad from UBC. Um, the auditor reviewed three aspects of my data analysis procedures to assess the credibility of my interpretation and was also provided um, lots of other materials like my graphic summaries and the chart notes to assist in her examination. So from all of that um, emerged eight broad themes and corresponding sub-themes um, from my data analysis. It may be hard to read, but I will be going through each one with some quotes to illustrate our, my participants' experiences. The themes are presented in no particular weight or importance. So theme one is managing academic expectations. Participants experienced intensity in their role as college or university students where the management of academic expectations became a very real and challenging part of their experience. In particular, participants described their challenges with organizing their materials, managing deadlines for papers and examinations, setting priorities, initiating and completing tasks, and feeling overwhelmed with multiple academic demands, including taking more than one class at a time, and shifting their attention between courses. Leo explained his difficulties with the organization, which resulted in multiple deadlines and requiring extensions, as illustrated in this quote. I'm going to read a few of the quotes out loud, and then I'm also not going to, so you all can um, read on your own, but I'll read this one. Getting assignments in on time is very difficult for me. Being an Aspie, losing things, being messy, professionally messy, missing a lot of deadlines. Like my creative writing professor had to give me extensions on some of the assignments because I kept on missing them. This is when I was depressed, but at the same time, I was still double booking appointments. In the next slide, Stephen shared his experiences of difficulties with time management, organization, and discussing these issues with his disability office. I'll go ahead and let you read this one. Some 
Similarly, Lindsay talked about her difficulties with executive functioning and her experience with the disability office. And she actually used the term executive dysfunction. I think that people who have d executive dis dysfunction should be able to have a different thing. Like, there's just so many steps. It's really complicated and really exhausting. And sometimes I don't get my exam accommodation because it's too much work. I'm like, I can't handle it. A few participants shared their experience with feeling overwhelmed with their course load. Out of four, I only did, I only completed one. So he was talking about taking a full course load and then managing one. When I first came here to college, I took two hard courses and I dropped the first one pretty fast. When you have many different courses, it's very easy to get more and more anxious. Taking five courses was the worst decision I made this year. In the broad theme of experiencing support, participants described a range of support both positive and negative accounts through various sources while attending college or university. Participants conveyed a range of support from professors, including being helpful, helpful when feeling overwhelmed, understanding and willing to help and listen, and exercising patience. Although some participants described not feeling as supported as they would like, particularly with respect to being heard by their professors and receiving their educational accommodations. With regards to support from campus organizations, participants expressed a range of support again, both positive and negative, from disability services, campus housing, and counseling services. It was mostly with disability services where some participants did not feel as supported as they would have liked in terms of feeling understood by their advisors and accessibility to their advisors. With regards to peer support, participants spoke to receiving support from peers during times of emotional duress and also finding peer support through online social outlets. One participant described the so online social outlets as his support network. Community and global systems refers to feeling supported through systems outside of the college or university environment, including support from parents, community mental health support, and global support, which refers to thinking of iconic figures with autism, such as Temple Grandin, to help them co cope, as one example. And lastly, supporting others, participants expressed the need for students with HFA and other disabilities to feel supported while attending college or university through support groups or more indirectly through apps to help them navigate aspects of post-secondary education. Melody shared her aspirations of starting a gaming company and hiring employees with autism. In the next quote, William described the lack of support from his professors after building the courage to ask for help. I shut down a little. I felt anxiety build up and anger and fear. I was reluctant to ask for help as usually am. But the time I started saying, I don't know what to do, help, the professors didn't know what to do either. They didn't have the support for helping someone like me. In the next quotes, participants shared more positive experiences with professors. Now I'll let you go ahead and read these ones on your own. Participants describe feeling supported through their disability offices, mostly the smaller institutions or institutions that have more established ASD supports, whereas others had more negative experiences in their interactions, as illustrated in the following quotes. For example, Stephen felt as though his advisor did not understand ASD. For example, he or she had said, well, well you've had an extension. You're not allowed to be stressed. And then I'll let you read the bottom one. In the next quote, William shared feeling supported by peers online while feeling emotionally dysregulated. I'm able to connect with people online because there's no barrier. It takes out my limitations. I can talk with them forever, but at the same time, you're missing something. People want that physical thing and you don't get that online. But still, I can go to someone online and say, help me please, I'm suffering. And they'll say, okay, I'll help you. I'll be here for you. And they can listen to you cry and all that. The broad theme of managing autism spectrum disorder 
symptoms and related symptoms illustrated the experience of having to manage both autism symptoms in addition to related symptoms while attending college or university. With respect to managing autism specific symptoms, some participants conveyed how their preference for a routine and restricted interests have been helpful in post-secondary education. So for example, fixating on subjects and doing really well, knowing more than anybody else in class about the topic. Um, whereas others indicated that their restricted interests distracted them from their academic work. They would daydream frequently and also reported difficulties with sensory dysregulation. Further complicating this experience, participants expressed that their academic difficulties exacerbated their symptoms of depression, ADHD, OCD, and in particular, anxiety. Anxiety was really a common thread throughout the experiences of the participants. And they also described on the flip side how these symptoms impacted their academic functioning. Many participants shared their experiences of depression while attending, which resulted either in taking time off of school or staying in school and becoming further depressed. One participant shared his great difficulty with managing his symptoms. Leo shared his challenges coping with sensory dysregulation. As an Aspie, I have a very sensitive nose. I smell things very easily and I hear things very sharply. So partying may not be the best choice, but that's where you meet people. And he continues in the bottom quote. In theme four, reference to or influence of past experiences is related to previous experiences in elementary or secondary school, such as challenges with socialization, academic functioning, and managing comorbid symptoms. Several participants referenced experiences in the past and also described experiences that have shaped their current experiences in post-secondary education in both positive and negative ways. Mark has shared how his social challenges in high school were difficult to cope with and has affected the rate at which he is learning to socialize with others in college. I've kind of been fighting my own demons throughout middle school and early high school. It, really, it, it wasn't until around my grade 11 year that I really came out of my shell and started making friends, and it's a battle. I'm basically fighting my inner demons at all times, trying to work socially. It's learned, just not something I was good at as a kid even. And so to be able to make friends and get to know people is something I've had to learn myself at a different rate than everybody else. Theme five is having a sense of appreciation, both social appreciation and academic appreciation. Participants expressed their appreciation of being a part of a college or university environment that is socially mature in nature compared to high school and being in the company of like-minded students who have chosen to attend college or university as opposed to having to be there. Participants also conveyed their appreciation for various academic experiences, including flexibility in course selection, engaging in course lectures, having respect for and being respected by their professors, and being in an environment that is intellectually stimulating and critically inclined. One participant actually shared that sitting in class and listening to his professor is just as good as going to a big screen theater and watching a movie. You all feel that way too, right? <laughs> in the following quote, Zach shared his appreciation for being in a more mature environment, which makes him feel more comfortable talking to others. I feel more comfortable talking to people around here than I did in high school. I prefer people here because there's a sense of maturity I didn't see in high school. And the people here want to be here. Where in high school, you go to high school because you have to go to high school. And so a lot of people there are just unbearable. Another participant, Stephen, conveyed his appreciation and respect for his professor's credentials in that he can ask his professors anything related to a topic. He also shared, <laughs> understand 
understanding autism spectrum disorder by others in self is related to the participant's desire for others to have a better understanding of autism spectrum disorder and is also related to the extent to which participants themselves understand ASD, how it affects their functioning, and the extent to which they self-advocate for their learning needs. Participants spoke at length to the notion of the invisible disability and how the needs of students with ASD are not immediately apparent compared to disabilities with more overt symptoms, more noticeable symptoms. They do not want to be perceived as a slacker when missing deadlines when they are really having challenges with anxiety. Stephen shared his experience with being misperceived by others due to his invisible disability. Another quote regarding the invisible disability is illustrated here. I seem very high functioning, and for a lot of people, I don't seem like an Aspie. So one of the problems with being well adapted is, upside, you don't have a lot of problems. Downside, no one recognizes it, recognizes it as easily, and it may be a bit hard to convince some people that you may need the help. The following quote highlights a participant's own understanding of ASD and how the disorder affects him, particularly with respect to advocating for his learning needs and accessing the uh, educational accommodations that he's eligible for. So I woke up early this morning to read my dissertation. And um, there was another quote that I didn't include here, but I want to read it out loud too because I think it's quite meaningful. It was from one of my participants who's 28, so a little older in age compared to the rest of the participants that provided a little bit more insight with respect to self-advocacy. He said here, part of the problem was the lack of self-awareness for your own kind of deficits and impairments. A lot of people in the school system say that in order to get accommodations, you have to ask in the first place. But the problem is, okay, here's the problem. How do you know that you have problems until you've tried your way through your difficulties? And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people with ASD, at least for myself, find difficult. How do you know that you need the help in the first place? You don't even know about it because you're not self-aware of the problems which I thought was very insightful and has a lot of implications for, I think, instruction in, in earlier years that we'll talk about in a few moments. Theme seven is managing the transition from high school and also navigating a new educational system. And the sub-theme of managing the transition from high school is related to aspects of preparing for post-secondary educational, post-secondary education, pardon me, including selecting a college or university, understanding the admissions process, and realizing the differences in the provision of services between high school and post-secondary education for students with disabilities. Participants indicated that attending college was a more natural progression, progression than attending university, as the environment was more community-like and similar to high school, although some of my participants enrolled straight into university. I felt like going to college would be a better step up for me than just going straight to university. I felt more comfortable going through more one-on-one -on -one stuff where you better know your instructors. So smaller class sizes makes it feel a bit more, a better step up from high school. As you, say, as you see on my quotes here, I didn't amend them in any way. Um, I wanted to maintain the integrity of what my participants said and so that's why some of the, um, it's not as, as fluid. And one participant described his challenges with the transition when he realized he was not going to get as much support he received in high school. Participants described their experience of also having to navigate a new system with regards to learning a new registration process, navigating the multiple websites that are provided for universities, um, accessing forms and grants, providing documentation related to their disability, accessing educational accommodations. 
Um, and in particular, participants relayed their challenges with the lack of understanding of the process to obtain accommodations and as such not receiving them in a timely manner. As Jeff expressed, one thing I regretted when I first came here, that I didn't get to know disability ser services a little sooner. Like after I registered, I got to know them. And it turns out I had an outdated psychoeducational assessment that was from 2007, but they were still willing to give me basic accommodations. Lastly, the theme of entering a new social world. In this theme, participants expressed a desire to befriend others while attending college or university, but also experienced uncertainty at the same time, mostly related to fear of rejection from others, not knowing how to respond to others, and the stress associated with socializing with others. In the sub-theme of difficulty initiating social interactions, participants describe challenges with joining a conversation, formulating replies, and difficulty meeting others with common interests. One participant indicated that he avoids conversation as, as it is too much effort and he wouldn't be able to, he wouldn't be afforded 10 minutes to think about a reply. Following a social template refers to the social process that participants use to interact with others. Participants described how they carefully observe others while they socialize so they can interact in similar ways. For example, memorizing social patterns and using those patterns as a code to then socialize with others. Lastly, finding social outlets refers to avenues in which um, students with HFA socialize, which is mostly online, and avenues in which they wish existed to foster socialization in college or university, such as smaller events or clubs based on shared interests. The following quote illustrates one participant's desire yet uncertainty in socializing with others. It's one of those sorts of things where you almost just poke, poke, poke. Did you get a good reaction? Did you get no reaction? And if you're shy, no reaction means, oh, they don't like me. I'll just go over here. With regards to following a social template, one participant described a systematic process he follows. One participant shared his difficulties of finding common interests with others while living in campus residence. I didn't really relate. I didn't get to choose who I roomed with. Two guys were brothers, golfers from Nova Scotia, majoring in business and economics respectively. We might as well have been from different planets. The only thing we had in common was that the one guy really liked Gladiator, the movie. Many participants express that online social networks are a primary social outlet as it reduces initial judgment and they meet people with similar interests, but they also wish that there were more planned social opportunities on campus to foster socialization. If there was like some kind of club or something, you know, an easier way to meet people, at least where people would have some kind of shared common ground, that makes it easier because then I can have a conversation about such and such and I can branch into other things. So that concludes um, the illustration of the, the results, the broad themes that resulted from my study. In terms of the contributions of the study, um, the findings have really filled a significant gap in the literature and to my knowledge to date is the first study of its kind. The results confirm our understanding based on theoretical challenges documented in the literature. So I failed to mention earlier that there are a lot of wonderful papers out there that theoretically describe the challenges that students might uh, experience in post-secondary education, but many of them aren't empirical papers, so they haven't really looked at it um, in an investigative way. Um, the findings of the study have illuminated critical experiences regarding um, the experiences of students with HFA in post-secondary education, including executive functioning deficits. So those were the planning, the organization, taking multiple classes. Um, issues related to support, managing symptoms in a post-secondary educational environment, the influence of past experiences academically and socially and how that affects it, their functioning currently. Autism awareness and knowledge, managing a new educational experience, and how social difficulties manifest in a college or university environment. 
Like any study, studies have strengths and they also have limitations. Often those limitations help us um, develop more research questions. And this is an area where we need to continue to develop more research questions and, um, and study in more depth. Um, in this study, males were disproportionately represented. Um, I had nine males and three females. That is, however, consistent with uh, the prevalence rate of autism. It's about three to four to one males to females. That being said, um, more studies need to be conducted with females and it just might require a bit more time in terms of your recruitment window to find female participants. Six of the participants had just completed year one of college university. It is possible that emergent themes may have been a bit different if the participants represented the later years. For example, two of my older participants talked about issues related to employment and dating, whereas for the majority of my participants, that really didn't come up, so it didn't form a broad theme. Um, but those are two issues that certainly require more research attention as well. It is possible that my study may have represented a subgroup of students with high functioning autism who are better connected to their post-secondary educational environments. However, that being said, a lot of the findings of this study are consistent with the theoretical challenges that are documented in the literature. There are many strengths. The study provided the opportunity for students with HFA to lend their voice and share their stories. Like I said earlier, the voices of students with disabilities are unsolicited, minimized, or overlooked. And so this is, again, very important to me that I was able to provide the opportunity for their voices to be heard in a very meaningful way. Participants represented five post-secondary institutions, which facilitates the transferability of the research findings. My participants had confirmed diagnoses of HFA or Asperger's disorder, which is really important. It means that we can attribute these findings to folks that actually have diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder, as opposed to ones that are suspected of having it or think that they might have it. The study was subjected to considerable scientific rigor when I went through those five validation strategies to ensure the credibility and the trustworthiness of the findings. And then the method of IPA really allowed me to focus on the breadth and depth of experiences as opposed to one experience, such as what is a social experience like? What is the academic experience like? And those would be great research questions, but this was a really nice overview of multiple experiences that my participants um, encountered in post-secondary education. Now, in terms of implications, where do we go from here? Supporting young adults with autism in post-secondary education is certainly gaining a lot of attention. And there are a lot of um, emerging wonderful programs like mentorship programs um, that are starting to become available. I would say that those are certainly in the beginning stages and they're in the right stages as we move forward and we're, we're going to want to start to test some of those programs um, in a research way. Um, but with, with the findings of this study, the under, understanding the challenges that students with HFA experience in post-sec illuminates um, the need to provide specific supports for students in high school, um, such as providing intervention and in executive skills, social skills, self-determination skills, those self-advocacy skills. Um, and a lot of that can be done through having that person be a part of their IEP meetings, their individual education plan meetings, having school staff have better awareness of autism spectrum disorder, having the school psychologist involved in providing that type of support. I had a thought to myself last night, um, typically we diagnose autism in the younger years, you know, before the age of five is, is really a nice critical w window to identify the disorder. However, our individual with high functioning autism are often diagnosed later in life, typically grade six, grade seven, on around age 12. Well, that being said, we always stress how important prevention is, early intervention. When you have someone diagnosed at age 12, we shouldn't change that mindset. We should still be thinking prevention, early intervention. Prevention and early intervention for a child who's 12 looks like social skills, looks like executive functioning skills. And those should be taken as seriously as some of the um, communication and language development in early childhood or you know that one-to-one -one applied behavioral analysis type of intervention. So I think we should keep that same mindset in terms of prevention and intervention for our older kids too because they are going to transition to post-secondary education or to community settings and we want to improve the outcomes for that transition and the best time to do that is in high school. Um, 
Mental health counseling is quite important for our students and capacity building for school staff. So it's easy to say, oh, there should be more supports available in high school. But if those folks don't have a full or a comprehensive idea of autism spectrum disorder and the needs and the challenges and the successes of this group, then it's going to be a little bit hard to provide that support. So this is a multifaceted um, issue. But um, again, this is a great place to continue and to start um, in a new to start in a few respects. Um, Post-secondary programming and support, so mentorship programs, like I said, those are uh, getting more and more attention. Disability awareness, so there's studies that indicate that there's not very good understanding of autism spectrum disorder among college or university students with ASD who, I mean, college or university students without ASD about ASD. And lastly, I think we need to look at policy development. So in post-secondary um, educational institutions, our disability services offices are typically um, really good at providing academic accommodations for students with um, ASD, uh, learning disorders, ADHD, and as well as physical accommodations for students with physical disabilities. But what they're not accustomed to is providing support in the area of socialization and executive functioning. And um, it doesn't come as a huge surprise because this is kind of a newer group that that is, um, that is, for lack of better words, showing up in post-secondary educational settings. But that doesn't mean that we kind of don't address it. So I think there needs to be maybe a pol uh, some discussion around policy and, and again awareness of how are these social challenges and how are these executive functioning challenges affecting academic performance. And I think we need to show that link, that link between those two or three factors um, and start having discussions around providing social support and uh, executive functioning support for this group. Again with that comes capacity building as well. Okay, lots of students in this room I see, so recommendations for future research for undergrad projects, master's projects, dissertation studies. Um, I, I think we need to look at executive functioning deficits with students with HFA in college or university settings. Um, there are some studies that do indicate that young adults have executive, young adults with ASD have executive functioning deficits, but we really haven't looked at whether or not college or university students with ASD have those deficits. So I think that's a great study. Looking at mental health functioning of students in post-sec with HFA, the experiences of fourth year students and graduate students may illuminate other factors that we need to look at critically with respect to dating and employment and independent living. And then also looking at the experiences of post-secondary educators, the disability advisors, the counselors, and the professors on what their experiences are like. Um, what's challenging? What's helpful? What's a big question mark? What don't we understand? What do we understand? What can we contribute? So on and so forth. I'd like to end with this quote from Zach, who is one of my participants. And he had said, thank you for doing this research because they forget about us after high school. And I think this quote is really quite poignant and it's quite meaningful and it can be interpreted in many ways. Um, what I take from this is let's continue to not only think about how we can support this group, not only conduct research related to this group, but not forgetting to ask them, what is it like for you? What is it like? What is going well? What's not going well? How can we help you? What is it like from your perspective? Because some of the findings from this study, we wouldn't have figured out if we didn't ask the question, tell me about your experiences from the time you started college or university to now, what has it been like for you? So I want to leave you with, with that to think about moving forward. And that's it. Thank <laughs> you.